Welcome to the Cartoonist Kayfabe Courtroom. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We're going to be looking at a Marv Wolfman testimony in the case of the ownership of uh, what characters, Jimmy? Five characters. Nova, Janus, Skull the Slayer, Blade, and Deacon Frost. Created by Wolfman between 67 and 72. Interesting. And uh, created before he was like freelancing at Marvel, which is, I guess, the case they're going to make as to why these characters are not work for hire. It's interesting. Uh, maybe we'll get into like where they appeared or whatever, because I know that uh, the Nova character absolutely appeared in fanzines and stuff with the same aesthetics and everything. Uh, it was really cool looking comics, real fun. Uh, but uh, Mark, Mark Wolfman making a play in 1999... You guys know how the game is played at home. Uh, Jimmy will be the voice of everybody who's not Marv Wolfman. I'll be Marv Wolfman. Interesting that this guy was editor-in-chief at Marvel for a cup of coffee, had a high editorial position at uh, DC Comics for a while. You would assume that he would know the score, as, as, uh, as Howard Chaikin describes it. They were taking the king's shilling willingly. And you know the deal. And uh, the John Byrne stuff in his editorial where he's saying uh, things like, you know, uh, what, what was the thing in quotes? It was like, oh, these rules that applied for decades don't apply to me syndrome or something right, he yeah. called it. <laughs> uh, you and I grew up knowing that this was just a deal. If you invent something for them, they keep it. So somebody whispered in his ear or they're, they're testing some new copyright. There, there's, a, there's a reason for this. And uh, we're doing the Marv Wolfman. One, K Faber sent us the, the TCJ and kind of got things on and popping. If you guys uh, know of any other depositions or testimony, send it our way. Uh, this stuff is incredibly fascinating. But people like Jeet here are like, you have to do the Wolfman testimony because of its historic uh, significance and also the drama involved. I don't know what that is. Right. Uh, even Eric Reynolds was like, I can't wait for you guys to do this because he has some cursory knowledge of it but we're providing you know the the audible version hey it's education for me too you know like like we've said before this is comics history under oath and by the people who were there yes. so uh i i dig it you know the reason we keep doing these is because i find them informative at the very least and, and usually entertaining yes this is going to be a big one man multi-parts for sure well i'm on board yes uh so once again you'll be uh the voice of all the the lawyers and the court, and I'll be uh, more Wolfman. And we'll... Oh, let me sh do a quick uh, thank you to Four Color Fantasies in Win Winchester, Virginia. Sent me my copy Sick. of this issue after uh, we we put out a call for it. I've done some signings there. It's a good store. So uh, thank you guys for watching the channel and supporting the channel this way. And and you know we we got sent this copy also. Uh, we need. We need issue 239, two copies, because that's the wrap up of this uh, deposition or this testimony. Actually, this is what we're doing. This is testimony in the court of law. Mm -hmm. So this is direct uh, examination uh, in front of a judge and all that. This is not, you know, with a video camera. Yeah, in not, a room not full a of deposition. Lawyers. Right. This is the real one. So I'm ready if you are. John Byrne is in the audience staring at Marv <laughs> making, making faces. faces. <laughs> Maybe we'll get there today. <laughs> Man, I hope that's noted in here. It is noted in here for Jeez. sure. Cartoonist Kayfabe is sponsored by us and the comics that we make. So please support our latest comics, the best way to support this channel, starting with my next book, Hulk Grand Design Monster and Hulk Grand Design Madness. These will be in your stores in March and in April, respectively. These are the main covers here, retelling the history of the Incredible Hulk. Uh, 500 plus issues, 10,000 plus pages retold in two oversized issues with some really great variant covers to choose from, including Ed Piscor's, Marcos Martin, Peach Momoko, and whenever we get into the Hulk Grand Design Madness, Jeff Darrow, Ed McGinnis. So let your co comic shop know you want these, and uh, it's March, Ed. These are going to be out in stores any minute now, so start picking those up. Speaking of, available now, new season of Red Room by Ed Piscor, Trigger Warnings. Red Room, Anti-Social Network, The Collection, both of these are now available in comic shops all over the world. This is the main cover for Trigger Warning starting the uh, 2022 season of Red Room. Uh, if you like violence and, and depravity, we're about to up the level of that and uh, start looking for Red Room, Trigger Warnings number two. This is the cover to, uh, to seek out. That'll be coming to your local store in April. You can also pick up our back catalog. 
from Ed Piscor, WYSIWYG, Hip Hop, Family Tree, four deluxe oversized volumes available as well as box sets telling the history of hip hop. The book that started the Grand Design Craze, X-Men Grand Design by Ed Piscor, three oversized treasury size edition volumes available telling the complete history of the X-Men. And my books that are still available in print everywhere books and comics are sold. The Plain Janes, the first young adult graphic novel here in America, and Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. All right, Ed, <clears throat> here we go. Yes. Good morning, Mr. Wolfman. Have you appeared in court before to testify? No, no, I haven't. This is the first time I've been in a courtroom. A little nervous? Yes. Do you need any water or anything? Yes, may I? Okay. That was my okay. I was <laughs> going to take a sip. See, I was, I was playing, doing real Sorry. theater. <laughs> Go ahead. What's your educational background? College, bachelor of, bachelor of Fine Arts degree, and a teacher. I taught art in junior high school. I'd like to talk about your background as a writer and creator. Are you a writer and creator of fictional stories and characters? Yes, I am. And where were those stories and characters used during your career? In the beginning of my career, in fan magazines, then magazines that I printed, fan magazines that you published and sold, then other types of magazines, articles, comic books, television, all manner of novels, all manner of publications. Did you ever write any comic books for the White House? Yes, I did three anti-drug books for the White House, anti-drug program back in the 1980s under the Just Say No program. Did you ever write any educational comics at any time? Several times. I was working at the National Runaway uh, Association for several books connected when I was working at DC. I've currently, for the last few years, been writing and editing a series of educational comics for Modern Curriculum Press, which was first a division of Simon & Schuster, now is a division of Pearson. And just to briefly go through some of your editorial duties, were you ever senior editor at DC Comics? Yes, I was. Were you once editor-in-chief at Marvel Comics? Yes. Were you also an editor at Warren Publishing Company? Yes. Were you also a comics editor for Disney Adventures magazine? Yes, I was. And you were editor once for educational comics? Yes, that was modern curriculum material. I'd like to mark for identification as Exhibit 500, a fanzine entitled Stories of Suspense. Would you identify that exhibit, please? Yes, it's right here. This is the first issue of a fan magazine that I published called Stories of Suspense, published in the mid-1960s. And what was the title of the article appearing in your fanzine? The first story is called The Vampires of Hungary. This is the first story in the first issue. And what did you do in connection with this fanzine? Well, I published the fanzine. I was editor of the fanzine. In this particular story, I was also the inker. And I take it by the title of it, it was a story that dealt with the genre of vampires? Yes. Did you sell this fanzine? Yes. This was advertised in another fanzine and several other fanzines that had large circulation. They would go out all around the country, all around the world, and if people wanted to buy based on my advertisement, they would buy it. Now, around this time period, the 1960s, had you acquired any knowledge regarding vampires? I like the material. Obviously, this is something I, you know, you do a fan magazine to explain uh, what this is. Uh, it's because it's something that you are a fan of. I did four different fan magazines. I did one on horror because I loved horror stories. I did a superhero fanzine called Super Adventures. I did a humor fanzine called The Foob. And I did an opinion fanzine called What The? Question uh, mark. They were all connected either with horror, science fiction, comedy, comic books. They were all comic book oriented. Okay, well, let's talk about the knowledge you acquired regarding vampires. Mostly through novels. I was a voracious reader of people like Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, Robert Block. Many of them had written a number of vampire-type stories, had seen some movies, Nosferatu, which is one of the earlier vampire films ever done. Had you read any vampire mythology books? Yes. This was just part of the research and material that I would do when I was writing anything. Did you ever read Bram Stoker's Dracula as a teenager? I read it as a kid, but in a kid's version, an abridged version, so I never read the novel until later. You know, the final version of it, which is like 800 pages, I think. Eight, 900 pages. I read the abridged version. I read a comic book adaptation. Later on, I had worked on uh, reprinting a story that was based on Bram Stoker's Dracula. Mr. Wolfman, can you identify Exhibit 600, please? This is the second issue of Stories of Suspense that I published, 
All the issues of Stories of Suspense were horror books that contained either comic book stories or prose horror stories. And what story is contained in this issue? This one is sort of humorous in that I have I was the first publisher of Stephen King's very first story uh, back when he was a kid. That's wow. pretty cool, man. Yeah, I didn't know that. And what is that entitled? It's called, quote, In a Half World of Terror, end quote. And this is King's very first one. Very prescient, I guess. Are you claiming rights in Stephen King's first horror story simply by the fact that he published this story? If I had, I have a hunch I would probably have been selling it for several million dollars by now to some movie company, maybe New Line. No, I'm not. Stephen King kept the rights of his own story. Of course. Mr. Wolfman, what is Exhibit 501? A copy of Super Adventures number 6. And what character is contained in that issue that you created? Well, among the many different characters that are in here, the one that's most pertinent is a man called Nova. And that's the character in your proof of claim, is that correct? Yes, it is. And did you create and draw the Nova character? I created it along with a friend, Len Wein. Would you describe the creation process of that character between you and Len Wein? We sat down together. We were very good friends. We worked out the ideas. I had wanted to make another character that had a stronger character and a better character because I handled it a little bit differently. And we talked about everything. We worked out the costume. We worked out the story details. That's why it's story and art by the two of us. We created the entire thing together. Did you write the story that appears in this issue number six of Super Adventures? Yes, I wrote chapter one and of course co-plotted co chapter two. He co-plotted chapter one and wrote chapter two. Who drew this chapter one? I drew chapter one. And when did you create the Nova character? In approximately 1967. Now I noticed that it has a legend saying Super Adventures number six, copyrighted 1967 by Marvin A. Wolfman. Right. Is that the date at which Nova was created? The year, rather? It may have taken a couple of weeks or months to draw the story, but yes, it would be in 1967. And would you identify where the Nova character appears in this exhibit? Well, he first appears on the cover, the one who's faced away from us. On the left-hand side, he's in the black uniform with the hood, the white sort of belt that has a stripe down the center that leads to the, I guess, a bootstrap or something. I don't know what you would call what that would be called. That's the character. Turning now to Exhibit 502, I'd like to mark for identification Exhibit 502 and 503 and have the witness explain what those are. Exhibit 502 is the cover and the first, I guess, the editorial page of Super Adventures number seven, the actual number seven, and 503 is the cover and the first page of Super Adventures number eight. Those are, again, two more issues, two more fan magazines that I had published. And when did you publish Super Adventures number seven? Summer 1967. And when did you publish Super Adventures issue number eight? It doesn't say, but it would have probably been winter 1967, early 1968. I tended, they tended to come out twice a year, maybe. Would you identify Exhibit 504? This is a copy of Super Adventures 9, uh, published in the fall of 1968. And did you create a character that appears in this publication as well? I created several characters that appeared in it. The one that's most pertinent here is, again, the man called Nova. Now, turning to Exhibit 598, I would like to direct your attention to the portion of that exhibit, control numbers 1231 through 1233. Is that a copyright application that you filed? Yes, I did. And which Super Adventures comic book was that this filed for? This would have been for number nine. Wait a second. What year? 1967? Hold on. I have to check. I need my dates here. No. That would have been for the first issue that a uh, man called Nova appeared. Did you prepare this copyright application yourself? Yes, I did. I want to ask you what you were claiming by virtue of your copyright registration for Super Adventures, issue number nine, shown in exhibit 598 at control number 1282. Well, I was protecting the entire magazine uh, for everyone who was creating for the magazine. What I had been informed was that I had to do it in that name, so I did. Everyone's own work is protected for themselves. For instance, 1283 is a drawing that Jack Kirby did for me, a fighting American. Who is Jack Kirby? Probably the most influential comic book artist, creator, writer ever. He started in the 1930s. He only died a few years ago. He was influential in every single decade that he ever worked. He created more great characters than anybody else. So did your copyright registration, are you claiming ownership in this Jack Kirby artwork? No. Your Honor, I'm going to object to this testimony. This is Fleischer now. Your Honor, I'm going to object to this testimony. It really calls for legal conclusion. What it 
protects is what the law requires for it to protect. Petrich, I think there's a best evidence objection here because the application says what it says, and that is the claim. The court overruled Diliberto. When you filed your registration, were you claiming ownership of the Jack Kirby artwork? Absolutely not. Fighting American, there's no way I could have claimed that. Is there any other original artwork here that was created by any other artist? Well, every character uh, in there was owned by their own people. On page, on page Wolf 1284, there's a drawing by Joe Kubert of a character called Tor, T-O-R, and that was owned by Joe Kubert. Uh, on 1287, there's a number of different characters, and for instance, I created the character on the bottom, which is Misterno. Uh, I kept the copyright and ownership on that character, and I created the Brain, who is the character to his left. Nova is by Lennon Me. The character to the immediate right of Nova is Cosmic Ray, and that's owned by Dave Herring. Frankly, I don't even remember who the other character is. Where is the Nova character? He's dead center. That's the character you and Len created? Yes. Now, the Nova story that appears in issue number nine, did you co-write that with Len Wein? No, this one Len did. So you wrote and drew the first story in issue number six, and then Len did the story for issue number nine? Yes. Since it was ours, both of us worked on it. Was it your understanding that your copyright registration protected it? Yes, protected it, made sure that all the people who created their characters owned their characters. So it protected works that you created yourself as well as those by other creators. Absolutely. But you were not claiming ownership of work created by other creators. I don't think that not only couldn't I claim it, but for instance, I don't think that I could have claimed Tarzan on 1321 or anything else that certainly was done years before. And again, these fanzine issues number six and number nine of Super Adventures, your entire Super Adventures, these were sold, you say, in interstate commerce? They were sold through the mill to virtually, I don't want to say every state, but everybody who wanted to buy them. They were sold all around the country. I had some orders from overseas. If somebody wanted it, they ordered it. We'll move on to Exhibit 506. If Mr. Wolfman would identify what the, that is. This is the cover and first page of Super Adventures 10, which is the last issue, I believe, of Super Adventures. And when did you publish that issue? It says 1969. I'd like to mark for identification Exhibit 507 and have Mr. Wolfman describe Exhibit 507. After doing fanzines, and while doing fanzines, actually, Len, Ween, and I were approached to do a story for Castle of Frankenstein, which was a horror magazine, and they asked us to do a comic book story, which we did. And did you create a character for this story? Again, Len and I were working together. We created this together. We drew everything together on this one, and we wrote it all together. And what was the character that appeared in this? It was called The Conjurer. Now, Exhibit 507, was that your first professional sale of a story you had written? Yes, it was, written and drawn. And you said that was for a Castle of Frankenstein publication. Did anyone at Castle of Frankenstein tell you that they would own your story or character, The Conjurer? Fleischer, objection. This is leading your honor. Court overruled. Diliberto, you may answer. No, no, not at all. What was your understanding of your relationship with the publisher who published Exhibit 507 in connection with your story and character? That this was our material, that he was going to publish it uh, the one time, which is all he did, and that we owned the character. Who is we? Again, Len and I were the co-creators on this. Uh, I mean, we sat down, this was something we did. So did you transfer any rights of your story and character to Castle of Frankenstein? Absolutely none. What did you, what did you sell them? for, if anything. The first printing rights, maybe a reprint, which they never did. Now, after this story and character, The Conjurer, were published in the Castle of Frankenstein magazine, did you ever use your story, The Conjurer, and that character again in your own publications? Yes. Going back to, it's the same issue as the last Nova story, issue nine, Super Adventures. And you say you use that Conjurer in your Super Adventures magazine issue number nine? Yes, it's the same character. It's called The Conjurer. Uh, it's even done in the same lettering style. Now at that same exhibit, would you please turn to control number 1285? It looks like there's a letters column which was written there with a reference to The Conjurer. Yes, the final comic strip is The Conjurer by yours truly. This is the second appearance of The Conjurer. The first was in Castle of Frankenstein. The original was written and illustrated by Len and myself, but I'm doing the solo bit this time around.
So you were informing your readers, you were reusing your characters, and they were previously published in Castle of Frankenstein. Yes. Your own fanzine, issue number nine, was published after the original Castle of Frankenstein publication? Yes, it was. I'd like to mark for identification Exhibit 607. Would you identify Exhibit 607? This is a script I wrote in 1970 to 1971 called The Death Stalker. And what character does this script involve? Well, this is about a hunter, a monster vampire hunter. The story is about chasing down a vampire and a few other monsters, uh, but the primary thing is hunting down this vampire for some reason that, unfortunately, I don't have the last page on, but it doesn't really matter. This was a script that I just did, which is a vampire story in 1970. And how can you affix 1970 as the date to the script? Well, the year I was a teacher was in 1970 to 1971, and I lived in... Uh, Lake Ronkonkoma, New York, and that's what the address is, and that's how I could identify the time period exactly. Would you identify Exhibit 608A? 608A, okay. Uh, this is a script that I wrote but did not sell for uh, Janice Hellspawn, and it's, I guess that's what it is. It's a script for that character. And that's a character on your proof of claim? Yes, it is. When did you write this script for Janice? Prior to 1970. Hands exhibit to the witness. Now I've shown you what appears to be the original script for the Janice character shown in exhibit 608A. Is that correct? Yes. And there's some sketching at the top right of that script. I had, because I had an art background, I occasionally would draw out my characters. And this was my attempt to do what Janice should look like. It appears that the sketching didn't come out on the exhibit. Is that at the top right corner? Yes. It is a very, very faint pencil. I don't even know what, and it's, of course, it's on a very strange paper. Since this was the only type of copying that you could do back then, uh, it wasn't a Xerox. And I tried when I made a copy, the Xerox copy, I tried to get it to print, but it didn't. Moving on to exhibit 608B, what does that represent? Okay, this is a page out of Tomb of Dracula featuring Janice when I brought Janice over to that book. That was a Marvel publication? Yes, it was. And the reason that the page is there is to show that the character is identical to the character that I created prior to 1970. You're referring to 608A now? Yes, I am referring to 608A, which, as I said, was written prior to 1970. And the reason that I can say that is because that's the house my parents lived in and I moved out in 1970. So it was prior to it. On page Wolf 1143, the description reads... To his side is Janice, the hero. He's tall. I didn't never knew him. Dude named Janice. Uh, he's tall, seven foot, noble, frightening looking, somber. His skin is yellow. His skin is yellows, highlighted with browns. His eyes are flaming red. His hair stark white. There's some costume colors which which weren't uh, followed through, but the rest. The look of the face is identical, and it matches the original drawing pretty much that I had done way back then. You're saying 608B matches your drawing. 608B matches the drawing on the script, and it certainly matches the description of the character written prior to 1970. Moving on to Exhibit 608C, would you identify that, please? This is, I believe, the first appearance of, I'm going to call him Janus in Tomb of Dracula. And again, would you describe the Janus character? Okay, well, gold-skinned, red eyes, white hair. He was, as in my script, uh, the previous exhibit, he's the son of, in this version, Dracula, who has come to Earth. Dracula, an immortal human being. He's come to Earth to fight his father. The cover is an indication of a character that's also appeared in my original script, or a visual, at least, uh, that appeared in my original script. This tentacled monster that's in both issue 62 of Tomb of Dracula and issue 63. It's the same general fight scene that appeared in uh, the story I wrote prior to 1970. The story in there deals with uh, Satan having sent this tentacled monster to fight Janus. The story that I wrote back in 19, before 1970 also had Satan sending a tentacled monster to destroy Janus. Janus is the original version, is the son of this as Modius demon as, and a human being. In the one I wrote prior to 1970 was the son of the Asmodeus demon, which is another name for Satan type and a human mortal being. 
Janus came to Earth to stop his father, and it's exactly the same thing. I just transferred the father from being Satan to Dracula. But then I put Satan in the book so that I can do the rest of the fight scene the way I had originally written it. So the Janus that appears in the Marvel publications is the same character as you originally created in your own script in 1970, pre-1970. Fleischer. Objection leading. Court overruled. It's identical in virtually every way possible. I even have a phrasing in there that's exactly the same from the original. I have to find it because in one I have something called the Circle of Fire and in the other uh, the Ring of Flame or something like that. Could you clarify, for example, 608C, what date is that? It says January. What year is it? That's copyright 1997, 1977, I'm sorry. So it was a 1977 book. When was the first appearance of Janus that you allowed to be used in a Marvel publication after your pre-1970 creation of the character? I'd have to. Hold on, please. Let me see if I can find it. Pause. Janus would have appeared in Tomb of Dracula 52, the first appearance. And when would that have been published? It would have been published in 1976. Yes, it was published in 1976. Going back to your working in the comic book industry, did you work at DC Comics at a point in time? Yes, I started at DC Comics in 1968. Until when? Well, I was an editor, assistant editor, then an editor until 71. So then I came back in 1980. Now, when you worked at DC, were you freelancing? In the very beginning, when I first started in, in 1968, yes. And so you were a cr contractor as well at the time, working out of your own home? Oh, yes. Okay. Did anybody at DC ever explain to you the disposition of rights and materials you would submit to DC Comics? The very first day I ever tried to submit anything to DC, an editor, Maury Boltonoff, who I was submitting the material to, said instantly, we own anything you submit, anything we buy, we own, DC owns. I couldn't have submitted any stories unless I agreed to that. Now, as a result of your discussion with Murray Boltonoff, the editor at DC, did you create any new characters for DC? The only characters that I created uh, were created with Len Wein when I broke into the industry before Len did, six, eight months before. Len was not intending to really be a writer. He wanted to be an artist, and I helped him along in the very beginning, and then Len wa went on to create brilliant work on his own. Did you submit any of your characters to DC during the early 1968-1970 period? Well, I submitted, let's see, I submitted Janus because the name Dick Giordano is listed. I'm talking about 608A, the Janus script, and I had approached Dick. I verbally pitched him the concept. He asked to see a script. I submitted it. He liked it. It was, the publisher wouldn't let me own it, so it didn't get published, even though Dick really liked it. You're referring to Dick Giordano. He was an editor at DC Comics. Yes. I told you that I had submitted the idea. He liked the script. He wanted a script. I wrote a script, which he liked. Then it was shown to the publisher. He rejected it because I wanted to own it. Own it being your story and character Janus? Yes, uh, because this was something I had created so many years before. And when did you submit the Janus story and character to DC for consideration? Well... This had to be six between 68 and 69 because, again, the address on the, the script is my parents' home, and that's where I was living at the time and moved out in 1970. Did you ever submit the character and story of Skull the Slayer for consideration by DC Comics? Yes. And what happened in that regard? It was the same instance. I sent it to Joe Orlando. Uh, I did want to keep that one, and it was turned down because I wanted to own it, and DC had made it clear, frankly, that they wouldn't do that. Fleischer. Objection. This is all hearsay, Your Honor. Court overruled. Diliberto. Do you ever to this day receive royalties from DC Comics for other characters that were created at DC Comics? Yes. I get royalties on merchandising. I get royalties on TV appearances. I get royalties on the comic books, of course. On toys, movie appearances. Uh, the feeling that one of my characters was in a movie, which... The what? The feeling that one of my characters was in a movie there was a batman animated film called the phantasm or something like that and i had a character called phantasm in teen titans presumably uh which was a book i wrote for them and because the movie people used the same name they gave me a you know they gave me money on that a check for that and also a character that i created in 1960 no 1970 called destiny they just published i'm sorry they just made a statue, a beautiful 
uh, dollar uh, statue of this character, and I got a royalty check plus a number of copies of that statue. Kayfabe Conjecture, that is the Destiny character that was in the Neil Gaiman Todd McFarlane deposition, who Gaiman goes on to use as one of the endless. That character was put on the sort of billfold for 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 Gaiman's ownership of like the characters he created, and he said strike that one because I did not create that character. And then when you go in and look at old DC comics and stuff, like to me it was shocking to to see like old House of Mystery or whatever, and it's the Destiny character that fits so snugly with the Endless. Yeah. So, dude, there's there's continuity in our depositions and testimonies. <laughs> it's a shared universe. Yeah. These testimonies existed. <laughs> Diliberto, did you ever try to submit a black superhero character to DC Comics in early 1968 or 1969? Oh, yeah. Would you describe that? What happened? Fleischer, objection, relevance, the court overruled. Len Wein and I were working on the Teen Titans. This was the original version of the comic book called the Teen Titans uh, back in that time period. What time period? 1970, 71, 69, someplace in there. And we were doing some stories, actually earlier than that, I'm sorry, 68, I think. We had submitted the story of a black superhero who is completely different uh, for DC. Their superheroes were Lily White, and I lived in New York City, as did Len. And we didn't understand why there were only white superheroes at DC. I wanted to do very much a street-oriented black character, which again was very different. DC was a very timid company at that point. It was, it didn't owe a lot to reality. That's the best way I can put it. And I wanted to make sure that there was a real black type character. And Len and I submitted a character called Joshua in T Titans. And it was uh, to be published under the title Titans and the Battle of Jericho. The story was written, again, at the behest of Dick Giordano. It was drawn. It was colored. It was going to the printer and the publisher pulled the story. What was the name of the character that would have been the black superhero in that story? Joshua. Why was the story pulled by the editor? The publisher that said that the writing wasn't very good, it had gone all the way, as I say, to the printer. He didn't like the writing, so another writer came in and re dialogued the entire job, and somehow the publisher didn't like this other writer's work. It was Neil Adams who was at the top, who was one of the top people at DC at the time, so he pulled it because he didn't like it. The editor, Dick Giordano, told me, and this is the only evidence I have of this. Fleischer. Objection, hearsay, the court. It is hearsay, but I will allow it. Dick Giordano told me it was because Carmine didn't want a black superhero. Uh, this has come into a lot of controversy, strangely enough, in the last year and a half as pages of the original story have been discovered and published in a fan type of magazine called Comic Book Artists. So it's your understanding there might be some racism in that decision to pull that character. That's what I was told by the editor. The publisher said it was because it was a bad story, even though it had been completely rewritten now did you begin at some point working with skywald publishing company yes i did S skywald was a magazine and comic magazine and comic book publisher about 1970 to my, maybe 1973 and when did you begin working with that company between 1970 and 71 and were you a freelance comic book writer at that time yes i was i was a teacher in patch patchock uh, long island and I was writing the comic strip separately. And who was the person that brought you into that company? So Brodsky. Was he a co-owner of the company? Yes. He's the Sky of Skywald. And Israel Waldman was the Wald in Skywald. And you were working as a freelance writer? Yes. Why don't you refer to Exhibit 508? It has the title Psycho. Would you identify that ex exhibit? This is the cover, the splash, the contents page, and a copy of my story that appeared in that issue of Psycho, uh, the May 1971 issue published by Skywald, which was a horror magazine. And was this publication, did this publication contain a story and character that you created? Yes, The Love Witch. Now, what was your understanding of your ownership of, for example, this story and character at the time that you began working with Skywald? I believe I owned this. I believe I owned it. Did anybody at Skywald tell you they would own all rights to materials that they published that you created? Absolutely not. Was there any ownership of that company that gave them ownership of that material that you created? No. Was there any talk of work for hire for material that you submitted? I never heard that term then. Was there ever a reprint of The Love Witch by another company down the road? 
Yes, in between the publication at Skywald, uh, there were two Love Witch stories that I wrote. At Skywald? Yes, at Skywald. Uh, one right after the other, though I think it may not have been printed in consecutive issues. I don't remember. Between that time and 1980, something or other, six, seven, someplace around there, maybe eight, I, I had become a top writer in comics. I was at this point in the mid-1980s. Uh, I was the top writer of DC Comics, certainly. I was writing the best-selling books that they had. I had just, which was the Teen Titans or the New Titans. We changed the name part of the way through. I just finished probably the biggest book DC ever had, which is called Crisis on Infinite Earths. And in fact, it's a book that was just reprinted in hardcover at $100. I mean, this was an incredibly special book and got DC an awful lot of attention and me. So my name was pretty big at that particular time and Skywald since gone bankrupt and the pages or the material was supposedly bought by Malibu Comics. So they claimed that they picked up the rights or something in bankruptcy. They wanted to use my name to sort of sell books so they decided to publish the book. They announced it in the fan trades uh, where you go to buy you know to find you find out uh, what's coming out in the next few months and I saw it listed and I got in touch with them and said you don't have the rights to the Love Witch. I'd like to mark for identification Exhibit 509. Can you identify that exhibit? Yes. This is the Mal Malibu reprint of Love Witch, published by their Eternity Comics division in 1989. And I called up and said, you don't have the rights to this. They said they thought they did. We talked about it. They're nice guys. They're good guys there. They agreed finally to do a deal. I wasn't caring about the money. It's always been the principle on something like this. I gave them a fee of $100, which was less than my, I think was my page rate for one page. Uh, they put the copyright in my name and the artist's name on the cover, and we did fine. Afterwards, I liked working with them so much, I later brought another book to them because they were good guys. I'd like to mark for identification Exhibit 510. I will ask you to identify that. This is another issue of Psycho that I wrote, and it features a story called Devil Woman. When did you write this story? I assume about the same time period. The splash page isn't there or the indicia isn't there. So it would be about the same time, 1971 approximately, in that area, yes. Was this a Skywall publication magazine? Yes, it is. I see at the top of control number 276, it says September 1972. What does that tell you about the creation date of your story? It would have been slightly prior to that. It could have been a month, three months, four months. I don't know when they printed this after I wrote it. Uh, sometimes there were inventory, but it was done, as I say, in 71, 72. Now, at some point in time, did you begin working with Warren Publishing Company? Yes, I did. And what is Warren Publishing Company? Like Skyworld, only uh, preceding Skyworld, they're a publisher of horror magazines, horror comic magazines, and another one called Famous Monsters of Filmland. They also printed, published other types of books throughout its history. And what were your duties with Skyworld? I was hired as a freelance editor three days a week for them. Did you work out of your home or at the office? I came in three days a week and worked there. Freelancing? Yes. And as editor, what were your duties at Warren Publishing? Buying stories, commissioning stories from writers, putting together the book, deciding what would be in it, trying to come up with the best ways to make it interesting. And who is Bill Dubay? When Dubai? I got... Yeah, sure, Dubay. Uh, when, when I got there... Bill was the art director. I believe uh, that was his title for Warren. After I left Warren, he became the editor. He replaced me. Do you know how long he remained at Warren? I believe about 12, 13 years. I'd like to mark for identification exhibit 511. Can you identify that? It's entitled Dracula. Yes. Warren was a black and white magazine. Most of his books were black and white, though he did some color books. When I was there, he was he wanted to start doing some color inserts to make the book books look interesting and he bought a lot of material from spain one of the comics he bought was under the title dracula because he wanted to do the story uh, in this country they needed a good translation they provided me with as the editor they provided me with a rough translation given by the spanish company that had originally printed the material and then i was to take that and write it retranslate the material into written english rather than just translated English. Is this the um, Dracula that that um, Chris Pitzer sends us? I believe it is, and I have a print copy of that. Yeah. Um, 
and it's really like special yeah good good stuff like worth worth looking at at some point all right back back to the uh case diliberto so what would be the time period at which you dialogue this dracula story at warren sometime in 1972 now you said warren purchased stories what do you mean by that well he published stories that's what i meant did he buy rights to stories oh no no he bought the publication rights and that was about it when you were at warren were you dealing directly with the writers who were to be published at warren that was my job uh, was to find writers and use some of the writers they already had come up with concepts on um occasion oh i see there's weird periods and stuff uh give them to writers solicit material from writers work with them edit their material so yes my my job uh, was totally working with the writers. Was it part of your duty to determine which stories would be published at Warren? 100%. Who owned Warren Publishing Company? James Warren. Now, did Mr. Warren or anybody else at his company tell you that they bought rights to stories and characters that they that were published? Fleischer. Objection, hearsay. No, no, they did not. The court overruled. Diliberto. Did Mr. Warren or anybody else at his company instruct you to tell publishers that Warren would own publishing rights to the characters? No. Fleischer. Objection, hearsay. Court overruled. Diliberto. Just give the judge a chance to respond to objections. I'm sorry. I've never done this. Was there any custom or publishing policy at Warren that you were aware that would have been given Warren rights to stories or characters that Warren published? No. Warren never claimed, never did anything that indicated that he owned any of the stories that we were buying. Fleischer. Objection. Not responsive. The court overruled. Diliberto. As editor at Warren, dealing directly with the writers, did you ever instruct the writers that Warren would be buying rights to their stories or characters? Absolutely not. Do you know Jeff Rovin, or did you know Jeff Rovin when you were at Warren Publishing? No. There was a company that Warren had called Captain Company? Yes. What do you know about Captain Company? Captain Company was a catalog company where he sold horror-type materials, books, masks, film strips. Uh, there weren't videotapes then. You know, you buy these little 8 millimeter films, little doodads, you know, um, eyes that pop, pop out eyes, stuff like that. It was a company of that sort, and he put all this horror-type stuff in the back of the books under the Captain Company catalog and would sell it. Now, are you aware of Warren Publishing Company or one of the companies filing for bankruptcy? Yes, I was aware that that some Warner Publishing did file for bankruptcy sometime, I believe, in the 1980s. Are you aware of any creators objecting to the sale of one of the Warren Publish one of the Warren companies to a company called Harris Publications? Yes, I received a letter from Bill Dubay, who, as I said, had become the editor following me, trying to get all the people who had worked at Warren to because all of us knew that they didn't have the rights to sell our material. I'd like to mark for identification Exhibit 513. I'm sorry, 512 and 513. Can you identify those exhibits? 512, yes. 512 is the cover and the acknowledgement page of a book called Forrest J. Ackerman, Monster. And the other is, as I say, acknowledgement page. Uh, it gives the copyright date 1986. Who is Forrest Ackerman? Forrest Ackerman was the editor editor of Famous of Mo Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine, which was a seminal book that Warren published, the very first book magazine that Warren published and worked. And I guess worked for Warren Publishing from day one to the very last day when Warren Publishing, uh, when they went bankrupt, about 25 years, maybe longer. Referring to Exhibit 512, I'd like to read a statement from what's titled Acknowledgements and ask you your opinion on this. It states that material published between 1958 and 1968, copyrighted by Central Publications, Inc. and Warren Publishing Company, appeared on a first publication rights basis, and rights were reverted after publication or repurchased by original publisher for one-time reprint and annual reprise editions or for pocketbook anthologies created by the editor. Based upon your experience at editor at Warren, is that an accurate statement? Yes. He, Warren, didn't buy the rights. Everyone then knew it. Exhibit 513, control number 143. It states that material published between 1968 and 1973, copyrighted by Warren Publishing Company, appeared on the first publication rights basis and rights were reverted after publication or repurchased by the original publisher for one-time reprint, annual reprise editions, corporate pocketbooks, 
created by the editor. Again, based on your experience, is that an accurate statement? It's an absolutely accurate statement. I'd like to discuss creation of the Blade and Deacon Frost characters. When did you create those characters? Early in 1972. And where were you freelancing at the time of creation? I was at Warren. I was an editor there. I was also freelancing a little bit at Skyworld, finishing up, I guess, uh, in DC. Now I'd like you to describe your creation of those two characters, Blade and Deacon Frost in early 1972. What if this is where we cut things off? I, I was kind of thinking that, because it feels like we're going to get into Blade and that's going to be uh, a, a pretty a, substantial a chapter piece. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're setting things up. I'm I glad. enjoyed the uh, walk through some of Warren's backstory. Yes. You know, I think about like Dark Horse reprints a bunch of those Warren stories. I wonder if that's all worked out with the artist and the creators, you know, uh, different writers, I suppose, on that material. These are the Corbin Collection, um, Alex Toth, Steve Ditko, Bernie Mike, Wrightson. Bernie Wrightson. Um, kind of interesting to, uh, to, to think about that stuff because, like, you see creepy and eerie reprints. So From Dark Horse. How's that all work? I can't believe they're tracking down all the creators and rebuying rights for that stuff. Yeah, yeah, sure. Huh. Uh, I wonder if it has to do with the Harris stuff. Uh, who, who knows, man? Could ask Uncle Marv. The other one that I that I would note is Skywald. I'm a fan of Skywald. Yeah. Um, Hell Rider is a it's a motorcycle comic, not exactly Ghost Rider esque. A couple issues were published. I like those. And um, there's a company that reprints like Golden Age and public domain stuff. Yeah can't remember the name of this company but you can find them on amazon and stuff and they reprint skywald and the skywald stuff is unusual in that it's much newer you know the right. golden age stuff that's in public domain is 20 30 years older than the skywald stuff but apparently according to them the skywald stuff is in public domain because somebody didn't file copyright renewals or something of that yeah. nature so um kind of an interesting little company uh I'm highly impressed by um, the tenacity of the fandom, uh, Marv Wolfman and Lynn Ween, drawing. I need to go. Rev I need to go check out my Bill Shelley books yes. and see if I can find some drawn Marv Wolfman Lynn Ween comics. I want to see what that looks like. And little did I know that the Nova comics that I was talking about earlier are drawn presumably by one or both of those right. guys, depending on pencil or ink or whatever. Um, the tenacity of doing multiple publications and like having four separate titles doing two a year that one going to at least 10, 10 issues. issues yeah that's impressive man. it's very impressive yeah and filing copyright claims yes that's uh that's some joe simon stuff right there yeah doing uh get uh, printing jack kirby illustrations Kubert illustrations like you know doing a lot of work and the second generation like i, I sort of consider like that group like a, a second generation of like you know post 1961 kind of marvel uh, people, that's where the these kids these kids would be sort of pilfered from fandom. You know, Gary Groth was being courted by Roy Thomas to be an editor at Marvel Comics on the strength of, you know, uh, fa fantastic fanzine and some of the zines that uh, Gary was doing. And of course, Roy Tom Thomas coming clearly out of that fandom generation, possibly a little bit older than the the ones we're talking about, but clearly a model yeah uh, you know if that if that guy is now your editor-in-chief or one of the top guys of course he's looking at fandom because that's his roots there are these stories uh len ween talks about it in um you can find these documentaries these kirby documentaries on on youtube uh talking about going to you know the long island house of kirby before he uproots and goes to cali and you go down in the dungeon and you say oh this is so cool oh this is so cool and kirby is just giving you pages mm. and as the kids go up and are walking out Roz is like uh-uh <laughs> uh-uh those stay here like here's a sandwich but like you know like those pages stay here I love it yeah yeah real good cop bad cop kind of gimmick oh man I love those kind of stories that's cool yeah so this is interesting stuff like that whole creating these things in his in his fanzines before going to Marvel like I'm very curious to see how this plays out because that certainly seems, I don't know, man, filing copyright for these characters ahead of time. Like, yeah. what are we going to see here? I mean, this is why you, every judge, lawyer, everybody out there, you don't, you never want Eddie P on your jury. So don't even like ask him to do jury duty <laughs> because I just believe I'm like, all the seeds that they're sowing, 
with like, oh, you did this and you didn't assume that you sold it. I'm buying it all. Here's the problem. <laughs> when this dude gets cross examined, if he does, I might be believing all that shit. I'm just very easily swayed. So don't ever put me on your jury, man, because I'm just the worst. Yeah, this I'm I'm so enthralled by this yeah. already. Like I have a lot of questions and I want to see a lot more testimony. Yes, yes. So uh what what about uh getting together and doing this stuff next week, man? <laughs> Let's do it. Let's continue the, <laughs> the, the the jam, dude. And you know what? There's there's dozens of pages here for this uh de de for this testimony. I mean, we're on page 32 and I'm seeing us go back to page 80 and it's continuing. So so there's a lot of stuff here multi multiple parts and it doesn't even you know it's to be continued basically the marv wolfman trial transcript will be concluded in tcj 239 you know we what need, we need two copies yeah i'm trying to figure out like i had a subscription to the comics journal and it would have been either like right before this or right after this uh whenever my subscription ran it was after check this out guys for the kayfabers at home a little poster for the faust movie and the inside front cover Oh, it's the, it's the it's the original motion picture soundtrack for Faust. I think I think what you're talking about is uh, after because I because I knew you right. I remember you talking about yeah. Your Alex. No, no. That, you see, I'm Alex looking at Ross back Ross? issues, and Alex Ross is 223 and 224, and that's when I was done. Yeah, I was like, I'm out. Two parts of this. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, this is 236, so a little bit later on, but um. Yeah, that kind of puts a snapshot for me. I mean, this is my post comics journal subscription had expired at this point. So like, I'm in, I'm making comics in 2001. I'm concerned about this stuff because I'm making my own comics, my yeah. fanzines, my minis, whatever they are. Um, but the creator rights thing, I mean, like, I'm a creator at this point. Yeah, they, they're, they're bad comics. <laughs> Nobody wants to track those down. I don't think Marvel wants any of those characters. <laughs> but I mean, this was so important. Yes. You know, like, like these conversations and this idea of you're keeping your copyright, being able to control the stuff that you make. Still so curious. And, you know, uh, I think I am connected with uh, Marv Wolfman on, uh, on Facebook. We might have to shoot with this dude. It, because because there's got to be some strategy here. The the guy was in administrative capacity in both companies, knew the deal. So there's something he he needs something on the books here. Well, hey, we might get to it. Yeah, you know it. It sounds like this is also pre that 1978 copyright revision law. Yeah, whenever these characters are being used. So, and everybody's telling us about how heartbreaking this is so there's right. going to be some some a, a swerve or two somewhere in here yeah because yeah. so far i'm on his side i'm like you ed it feels like what's going on he created these characters ahead of time yeah and the way they lay it out you know the lawyers is you, it's see, it's, a, this, it's this, amazing what his lawyer can make his story sound like yeah this is the other reason <laughs> why why you don't want me on can i speak for you you don't want jimmy on your jury i don't want to be either. on a jury <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah uh it's such pandering, and it's so clear that you're you're creating a narrative for us, and and it's like we see what you're doing. And if I was on the jury, I would be like, "You are insulting me. You are pandering to me. Guilty." <laughs> Show don't tell. <laughs> yeah, we're storytellers here. You good to go? <laughs> yes. K favors like follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What is out there, Jimmy? Dude, it's cartoonist K Fabe month. It's March. That means Hulk Grand Design Monster Number One is coming to your local comic shop. If you haven't already reserved a copy, tell your story you want one now. It's not too late for them to pre-order it. And join me on Patreon.com/slash JimRug. Red Room Trigger Warnings Issue Number One out on the stands right now. Thank you guys so much for supporting it, man. It's always fun when a new issue comes out and then you see a mad volume of Instagram I was say, stories I've been coming a lot of through. Posts. Love that shit. Thank you guys so much for supporting the comic. It's going to be coming out. Uh, on a monthly basis so every four weeks or so like clockwork man those issues are done and wrapped up in a bun ready to go uh you could read those comics on my patreon before they hit paper though uh patreon.com slash ed piscor three bucks for the archive there more than 200 pages of comics you could get to all those links in the link tree in the description below this video what else jimmy subscribe to the cartoonist kfab newsletter at the links below this video you can also find cartoonist kfab t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video that's another great way to support the cartoonist kfab channel uh without further ado jimmy given those marching orders we'll be on our way read more comics and stay out of jail and keep us off your jury <laughs>